There we go. So we're awesome, right? The Ruby community is. I mean, you know, we can be. I've um, been programming 14 years, and I've been in a number of different communities, and um, I've never seen one as cool as Ruby. I mean, the language is really cool, of course, but the community is really special. And uh, it's kind of hard to put your finger on what is so special about it. Uh, there's, you know, there's a passion, there's a willingness to share and to support one another. And those are pretty unique things, great online community. I think a lot of other communities are kind of catching up with some of that. Uh, but one of the things that's really interesting is our conferences. I mean, wow, we totally just knock it out of the park with our conferences. This is actually this is a conference that I run in uh, Boulder. Um, uh, thank you. Um, but the thing is, first of all, RubyConf is amazing, and considering how it was back in 2001 when it started, I mean, it's, it's community-driven, it's totally about you, it's about us. I mean, people would actually pay money, their own money, to go to this conference to learn and share and collaborate with other people, whereas other conferences back then were very much about corporate agendas or marketing or selling products or whatnot. They certainly weren't quite as driven about the people who are in the seats as uh, the Ruby conferences have been. And it's amazing to think of all the regional Ruby conferences that are out there now. I mean, there's one nearly um, uh, every month. Uh, there's, there, during the conference uh, season, you know, from spring to fall, there's almost one every weekend. And right now, there's a string of them down in South America. So it's amazing. I don't know if you realize how many of these conferences are out there. But they're everywhere. And of course, here we are in Kansas City, and it's sold out. That's awesome. But I think we can, um, we can do better. And although I'm not going to focus on uh, the conference circuit or our online community, I think that's all great. I want to focus on local because I think uh, that is where we can really amp it up here and is also something that you guys all can do something about. So, of course, we need to go on a community safari for this. <laughs> so, I'm going to put three. <laughs> this, by the way, is um, the Banjo Billy bus. So, at uh, Rocky Mountain Ruby, Mount RB, we use this bus to take people from the conference hotel to the Avery Tap Room and have some awesome craft beer. And, yes, indeed, that's what we got in. So, safari away. So, there's three points that I want you to, there's some focus points that I want you to um, think about ways you can improve your local community. The first one is we need more programmers. There are not enough people out there programming Ruby. There's too much demand. And I don't think, one, that schools are going to be able to keep up. Two, the companies can train. And I think that really this should belong in the role of the community to help find people that want to program and give them the path to get into that. Number two, leveling up, getting better. There are a lot of ways you can do this on your own online. But as a community, I want to see more structured ways that people who are new, who want to learn Ruby, or who already exist in the community and are doing Ruby, a way for them to get better. And finally, if my thing will work, there we go. <laughs> oh no, failed batteries. Um, community raising. This is the idea of going out and fostering uh, communities or groups in places that are underserved. This could be the idea that, uh, and I'll just do hypothetical because I don't really know, but let's say that you, there's nothing in Topeka, Kansas, but yet you might go and help start something in Topeka, Kansas to make that better, perhaps. So let me talk a little bit about my story. So this is um, Long's Peak. This is a uh, view from Longmont, sort of out my uh, back door. I moved actually to Colorado in 2005 from the Kansas City area. I was living in Lawrence. And when I moved out there, I didn't know anybody at all. Actually, my job was remote, and so I didn't actually have office mates that I could go and learn the lay of the land from. But I was a brave sort, so it didn't matter. I went out and I networked aggressively. I was also was discovering Ruby at this point. And um, I was really uh, disappointed by that there was no one talking about Ruby back then in the area. So I went and started Boulder Ruby um, to, uh, to talk about Ruby, because I wanted to meet other Rubyists and talk about that. And that's been uh, about six years now since I've done that, and it's going great. But when I did this, I actually didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I wanted to talk about Ruby, but I didn't know how to run events. I didn't know how to grow a user group or any of that sort of thing. I just started asking questions and just did it. And so a lot of what I'm going to share with you today is to help you do this sort of a thing or other things like that uh, without making the mistakes and give you a leg up on the process. I also um, progressed into doing conferences, and I don't know how this actually happened. I think Mike Moore and Pat Eiler dragged me into Mountain West back in 2007, and, uh, and that just sort of took off. I think Pratt's a little crazy. So 
Um, although I've done these things, I don't necessarily recommend you go Marty crazy route in terms of event organizing. But of course, now I have my own conference in Boulder, and I'm called Rock, Rocky Mountain Ruby, um, and it's a lot of fun. So uh, we're going to talk about what you can do. Because you don't have to be Marty, you can actually be anybody who wants to help out and is willing to put in the effort. You can do this. Now, this is a picture of Prakash Murthy. And Prakash, uh, his Olympic program about a year and a half. He came to the Boulder area and he sought myself out and Chad Fowler. And he said, I want to get better. I want to um, learn Ruby and I uh, want to get involved. And so we gave him some advice. He really went to it. He taught himself how to program. He got an internship and now he's consulting. And What's really cool is within about six months, he decided he wanted to help out build the local community by doing code retreats and bug mashes. He took it upon himself. He didn't ask me for permission. He didn't say, Marty, can you make this happen for us? He just went and did it. And he's loving it. Uh, and so if Prakash can do it, then any of you can do it for certain. So we're going to focus on local because I think that's where you can make the most difference. Uh, it's also the easiest thing for you to do. You don't have to go uh, big, do large events like this one that are very daunting to pull off. You can do something very simple and something that is local because that's where you can find the people, you can bring them out, you can help them get better, and, and it's going to be feasible for you to do this. So the thing I want to encourage you to do is be intentional. Don't be accidental about what you want. Think about what your goal is. What are you going to try and accomplish? Don't try to take on too much. Take on just what you want to try to do. And think about my three points that I mentioned earlier, whether you want to bring new programmers in, or maybe have an event that makes people better, or maybe perhaps grow a community in another location. Think about what you want to do. Who is aware of what this phrase means? OK. This is an acronym, actually. This is MOTS. MOTS, of course, the creator of Ruby. And this stands for MOTS is nice, and so we are nice. <laughs> kind of funny, isn't it? Well, uh, I think someone maybe from Japan coined that, perhaps? I don't know. I'm not sure. Do we know who actually coined this? I'm not sure. I, I've known it for a few years. But, but this is really cool. And I think this is a great example of what I would call intentional community. Although Matt did not intend this probably when he first started. He, when he first created Ruby, he wanted a programming language that he would love to program in, that would bring happiness back to programming. And so that drives a lot of what he does when he develops Ruby and, and builds the language up. But it also, I think, directs how he interacts with the community. A very nice guy. And also, I think, with Dave Thomas and the people who got involved with Ruby as it came to the English-speaking world, I think it drove sort of what they wanted to do and how open and how willing they were to share and how they wanted to help other people by spreading Ruby and doing RubyConf. I think this all has set a template, has driven sort of this, this pattern of how we as Rubyists are and how we treat other people that is carried forth to today. I think it's pretty sure I guarantee that, that this is why Ruby community is so awesome than what it could have been if somebody else was driving Ruby instead of Matt's. And of course, I have a name for this. It's called the community template. And this is sort of an intangible, maybe energetic thing. It, it surrounds us. It uh, penetrates us. It binds us together. And um, it's, it's, you, can, you can think of it as like your intentions, what you intend to do. It, you know, people can feel it. They, can, they, they feel the vibe. And, if you have, you know, want to make it competitive, or if you want to make lots of money, then that's going to come out, and that's going to drive what this thing eventually becomes. So as you're thinking about what you want to do, your intentions will manifest in a certain way. It might attract certain people to your event. It might not attract certain people to your event. So I think it's very important that you're aware, you're kind of what, what your intentions are as you plan out your event. So of course, the first step you need to do is you need to plan out your plot. You need to figure out what exactly it is that you're going to try to do. Consider what's going on already in your community. But give it some thought and go ahead and, and intentionally go about that process. Another point I want to make about this planning process is planning for your zone. Just like how you wouldn't necessarily take an orange tree from Florida and try and plant it in Kansas City and have an orange grove, it's not going to work, right? Because orange trees don't grow here because it's the wrong zone. 
The same thing goes for community events. You know, if there's an event that's really successful in San Francisco or, say, New York or even Boulder, it might not fly so well here or in Des Moines or maybe Wichita, Kansas or something like that. So you have to consider what's your local community like? You know, how many people are there? How, what's the level of expertise in terms of programming? What sort of business community support for Ruby or for technology is there? And you have to consider those things before you set your ambitions for a certain type of event. I think any event can be successful in any community. It just you have to uh, be realistic about what you're going to be able to pull off, at least initially. So there's three event styles that I'd like to, to consider as you're putting together your event. The first one we're going to talk about is lecture. And that is essentially what is happening right now. It is where you have one person present, presenting information to a large group of people. Um, it is uh, pretty good at, say, inspiring, at, at giving out lots of information, uh, covering a lot of ground. It is not so good for conversations. And it's not so good for you getting better, you honing your skills. You might leave here saying, awesome, Marty, I'm going to go and do something about this. But you're probably not you know, leveling up in your skill right now. The next component is social. And social, I think, is really important. I think, actually, the Ruby community has the social things down pretty well. But I think that social is, uh, every community should have a regular social component that's happening. This is where you get, you get together, you're hanging out. Um, perhaps there are beverages, and there's food involved. But it's unstructured. It allows people to have conversations. And this is where people will ask tough questions, or will have those tough conversations. And they will also form a bond with each other. They'll get to know each other, and there'll be a better level of trust and a sense of community that comes when you have these sorts of events happening on a regular basis. And finally, interactive. Interactive, this is uh, your hack fest, your code retreats, um, any sort of hands-on workshops, things where people are working together with other people doing actual things on their laptops or whatnot. And I think interactive sessions are probably underrepresented in local communities. And I think it is definitely the one that is the best for honing skills and mentoring. And that is very important if you want to improve um, your, the skills of the people involved in your community. Now this talk, um, I gave this at RubyConf, and it was a lot longer there, so I distilled it down. And so one of the things I've done is I've taken probably a dozen slides out of this talk, and I put it on a blog post called Event Organizing 101. There's a bit.ly link to it. Uh, these slides, um, they are available. Um, I'll post a link uh, probably through Twitter. Maybe we'll retweet it through uh, Ruby Midwest's account. Um, so you can get to this after the fact. But um, I've gone through a ton of things, very low level, nuts and bolts types of things about how to uh, organize and run events. Things like how do you find space, how do you find sponsors, how do you do budgets, how do you f reach out and find people and tell them about your event. All kinds of things like this. And I encourage you also, um, after you read this, if you're going to do an event type thing, then um, after you read it, if, if there's uh, any questions or if I, I didn't put something in there that you really want to know about, please um, leave a comment on the site, and um, I'd be happy to either expand the post or uh, do a follow-up post. I will say one thing, though, or a couple things, about um, doing event organizing. Um, and that is, you should ease into it. Don't try to take on too much for your first event. Uh, and of course, I, I recommend you always start small and let it grow organically. You try to kill yourself by doing marketing and, and doing a lot of word of mouth and, and trying to get flyers and that stuff out there. Do something simple. Use Twitter. Use uh, you know word of mouth through your your um, your friends and the people you work with. Um, try to keep your event free and low cost. I mean, the minute the minute that you have a lot of expenses and you have to write checks to uh, venues and to um, caterers and what sort of that 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 really uh, ups the ante and makes it uh, a little more nerve wracking for your event. But you can do free events. It's, uh, they're great. And I recommend you start with that. Of course, uh, look for sponsored space. Um, you know, have audio video provided by people that uh, either have the space or by uh, other tech companies. And uh, delay any sort of expenses that you can. You can always add this stuff on later on, especially if your event starts taking off. So uh, don't kill yourself trying to do it initially. So let's talk about the specific um, points that I mentioned. I'm going to give you some concrete examples and some things you can think about to uh, accomplish some of these things. So throwing programmers. Um, the first thing I would say is consider how inviting your event is to newbies. If you are new to programming, 
or to Ruby, or, and you didn't know anybody in this group. If you were to show up to your event, how would you feel? Would you feel maybe a little intimidated? Would you realize it's all over your head and probably would never come back? The, this is a real concern that a lot of our events, um, just by the nature of how they are and how they've uh, um, uh, adapted over time, they, uh, they probably aren't, uh, people aren't going to stick with it. And there are a couple uh, suggestions that you can do here. One, you can have, say, a section of your event, depending on what it is, be totally newbie friendly. You know, make it very clear that this section, this this <coughs> portion of the event, you know, no experience required. You don't have to have, uh, you know, the topic is covered is very introductory or whatnot. Uh, that's one good way of doing it. The other one is actually have a, an event, maybe an infrequent event in your community that is totally geared towards newbies, like a meet Ruby night or an intro to programming kind of night. And uh, that would be another way that you could kind of push people who are new to your community to go to this and get kind of get them introduced so then they can come to your regular events and feel uh, more comfortable with that. The other piece is diversity. Uh, and this is Sarah Allen from Rails Bridge. And uh, Sarah Allen and Sarah May do uh, this Rails Bridge workshop that uh, specifically encourages women to get into Ruby programming. And I think that, uh, that diversifying your population is really important. I think that uh, it's not easy, and I'm not going to give you a lot of uh, tips here tonight um, about how you could possibly do that, mainly because it would take too long, and I'm actually not the most expert uh, person on diversity. There's a lot of other speakers that have done talks that are on the video that are available that you can watch on this, this topic, but I will say two things. First of all, you need to be hypersensitive about how uh, your event is perceived by people of a different uh, either gender or maybe uh, nationality or something like that. And uh, you know uh, they they will pick up these things, these cues. Perhaps it's the language that's used in the meeting. Perhaps it's how uh, maybe some of the events that are happening. Uh, it, it, it's something you just have to be hypersensitive to to make sure that you aren't uh, setting up any barrier that people are not comfortable with. The other thing you can do is explicitly invite them out, saying we would like you to come to our event. And by doing so, they'll say, oh well, I I really thought that I'd be welcome there, but now that I have been invited, perhaps I'll come out. So these are two things that you can consider for diversity, but I do think it's an important thing, especially in terms of growing your population of uh, programmers in your group. So reach beyond, and um, you don't have to be Reed Richards to do this. You can be just a normal mortal, a uh, normal person, not mutant or anything like that. And um, <clears throat> the, thing, the thing I want to say about this is we all have our, our tech circles, you know, our Twitter followers, the people that normally frequent our events and that we normally talk to. Um, there are more people out there than that, unless you're some amazing network, you know, awesome guy or knows everyone in the community. There's probably a lot of people doing Ruby or doing programming that would be really interested in your type of events that are out there that you're not reaching. They're not hearing, they don't know about your event, you know, they're not getting the updates. And it's not going to be easy, but you can reach them. And so I think with this point is that you have to be creative and try some different um, avenues to go out and find them and let them know about your event. And again, like with diversity, you want to invite them out and make them welcome by having a specific event or uh, part of your event that's, that's for them. Finally, uh, the next generation, and that's with children. There's actually two kind of cool movements going on right now out there. Uh, that is specifically for kids. And I know specifically about Kids Ruby, that's Ron Evans and some of his friends putting that together. And uh, it's really pretty cool. Um, it's a, uh, a lightweight curriculum that is about programming, geared towards children. It's fun. Uh, I think right now they have maybe about a day's worth of material, but they're constantly expanding it. And this is something that you can, uh, you can go to their website and you can take this and you can run a Kids Ruby Day or whatever in your local community. And this can be a lot of fun. Uh, this is a picture that, that Ron sent me from one of their events that they did. And I think it's a great way of introducing programming to the next generation, showing them this is actually pretty cool stuff. You know, this is not rocket science. You know, you can do this stuff, and you can actually have a lot of fun along the way. So never too early to get them introduced to that. So here's a few other ideas that you might consider for um, expanding your, uh, growing your programmers. I mentioned the Meet Ruby stuff, new programmer outreach. 
Um, cherry training workshops, kind of like what happened yesterday, is another great thing. It's structured, it's, um, it's free, maybe perhaps just a donation only is required. It gives back to the community, so there's a lot of good press about that. You might even be able to get a newspaper to do an article about your uh, community training workshop, perhaps. Uh, meeting mashups, this is something that we did in Boulder where we had the Boulder Android uh, user group and the Boulder Ruby uh, user group met in the same space, the same day. We actually had two different rooms, so we weren't like, you know, fighting for uh, the stage or anything like that. But, but we did have a common space where we were mingling, and that was really pretty interesting. Um, you know, kind of picked on the Ruby, uh, Android guys, but, you know, whatever, it's, it's all fair. Um, volunteering at schools. There's a lot of public schools out there, middle schools and high schools, that are happy to have professionals or dads, uh, moms, whatnot, come in and talk about programming to their students. So another way of, of reaching out. So leveling up, um, getting people better. Of course, whenever I think about this topic, I think about Kathy Sierra. And unfortunately, she's not uh, active uh, speaking, blogging, or on social media anymore. But her blog is still up. It's uh, creating passionate users. There's the uh, there's the link to it on the bottom there. And she has a ton of material. I won't really go into a lot of today, but she goes really deeply into how do you make people better? How do you make them rock when they're using your product or service or whatnot? And I think that uh, it would be worth your time if you want to go about this leveling people up, making them better, to visit her site for about an hour or so. There's a lot of good material there. Toastmasters, Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick mentioned Toastmasters in the last, what, year, year and a half? And I think this is really fascinating. This is an educational organization. It's all about uh, enhancing communication skills and leadership skills by doing things. And they have this real structured uh, uh, sort of program, curriculum, if you will, of how you come in and things you need to do and, and getting to the next level. And uh, I think it's, uh, this is a model that certainly could work for programming, no doubt, and uh, something you could possibly consider uh, for uh, your organization for an event you might want to do. And I thought of another parallel with this, and that's scouting. Uh, scouting is another organization that's been around actually 100 years, it's about the same time as Toastmasters was started. And it's very much about hands-on skills improvement, you know, starting with very simple things, working on what can pretty advanced skills. And um, it's something I think we could borrow. And this actually is my son here, he's in the front there working on um, a cooperative uh, skill with another boy, uh, walking with these big boards on his feet. But um, so this is something actually we're starting. Uh, there's a repo down there which is a, called the Ruby Handbook, which is uh, modeled off after the uh, Boy Scout and Cub Scout handbooks. And they're basically activities, or eventually will be activities. Right now, if you go to the repo, uh, there's just a readme. Um, that's all it is right now. Uh, I just, just started a few weeks ago, and haven't got as far as I'd like, but there's a number of us in Boulder that are going to be working on this. And the idea is that uh, it'll be small, uh, different sort of activities you can do, like setting up your environment, you know, uh, you know, basic Git workflow, uh, you know, make, uh, Ruby basics and stuff like that. That there'll be manageable chunks. They're uh, self-guided. You can work on them on your own, and uh, you can work. It'd be a great thing you could do some evening, uh, you know, with a group of people. You could work through an activity or two, and uh, that's kind of the idea with it. Is it's just a, a lightweight guide that people could use to um, kind of cover the basis of uh, basic programming. So hopefully that will develop and become useful in the next few months. But there's a link to that. Code retreats. I actually don't have to talk too much about this because Angel did a wonderful job mentioning code retreats. Code retreats are awesome. Uh, we actually had the largest code retreat in Boulder uh, in February, and uh, it was 60 people. I don't recommend a code retreat with 60 people. Oh, um, too many. It was too big. It was overwhelming. Chad uh, Fowler and Corey Haynes both co-facilitated this, and it was it was awesome, but it was a little intense. Um, so that you can imagine the closing circle. It was. Barely get everyone in their space in this big circle uh, at the very end. But but uh, code retreats are great. They're a great way of leveling up your skills, and they're a lot of fun. And it's awesome. That, of course, December third is Code Retreat Global Day, and uh, I guess uh, Wes has uh, got the information on the local Code Retreat here in uh, Kansas City. I know we have four of them in Colorado that we're doing, and um, definitely check it out. Highly <laughs> highly recommended. Yes, Angel. And that's right. Uh, and the code tree model is so that you can go and do it. Uh, I would highly recommend you probably go to one first uh, so you kind of know what you do and how to go about facilitating a uh, code tree. But uh, the idea is, and Corey wants you to do this, is he wants you to do your own code retreats in your own community. And you don't need Corey to show up. I mean, I think he still likes to go to some of them, but he can't keep up with all of them now. So, code retreats. Some other ideas. 
Um, cooperative programming challenges. We have one of these in one of our hackfests in Boulder, where they have a little programming challenge, kind of like what happened last night. But uh, you know, you can do something like that, like kind of like a Ruby quiz sort of thing. And I, I think that those are a lot of fun in terms of giving some sort of structure for people to kind of work on. And let's see, okay, time. And then bug mashes. Bug mashes are another great thing. They're lightweight. You give back to the community. It's structured. It's a great way of pairing with someone and getting better. So. Community raising, I will mention only a few things for this, and um, I'll let you read the slides. I'll mention a little bit on the last one. This is, of course, the idea that you're going into a place where there's not a lot of support for Ruby events yet, and you're kind of helping one go. The, the last one is an interesting one that I, I like to encourage, and this has happened with the code retreats, is where you might set up an event in a community that you're not part of. And you'll go, and of course, you'll find, hopefully find someone there so you can kind of get word out. But the idea is that you'll have some cool, like a code retreat or like a Ruby day or something like that that you can do like a one-time thing and then hopefully after that's done there'll be you know a handful of people or more from that local community that might say hey let's keep this going let's do something with that so that's an idea but so let's let's I, regardless of all these ideas i want you to be creative you know don't just do the boring old user group thing i mean i think user groups are great i, I don't i think they're they're vital to have going in your community but i want you to be more creative than that i want you to think about those three points i mentioned earlier and how can you make your community better by doing something interesting take some risk have some fun with it and yeah have fun so one thing about event organizing is it can be a lot of work um and if you're not careful you can burn yourself out and that's no good so make sure you're having fun make sure that it doesn't become a chore and get help, you know, have people help you so you don't have to do it by yourself because that's the quick way to burn up. So remember to have fun. And I want to say it's also very, very rewarding. When I started doing this uh, six years ago, I had no idea the amount of growth that I would go through. And I get a lot of feedback from people who approach me and say, Marty, I really appreciate that mentoring you gave me or, you know, that one event that you ran, I learned so much, you gave me confidence to do these other things. It's awesome. So uh, it's incredibly rewarding to do this sort of stuff. So if you go on this path, uh, you will be rewarded, so uh, I highly recommend it. So, get involved, make a goal, be intentional about it, Smart, start small and have fun with it, and make the community better. Thank you. <laughs> so, we have a for questions. Uh, bug mashes are a, a fairly informal gathering where people get together and they work on bugs, usually Rails bugs, uh, in pairs, um, you know, for a half a day or something, you know, for a number of hours. So it's just like a project, an open source project. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And uh, I know with Rails bug mashes, they've had a number of them out um, uh, over the last year or so, and you can you can uh, reach out to Tinderla to Aaron Patterson, and he'll he'll be happy to get you set up with. With the ideas behind that, how do you how do you do it? Yes. So you talked about the three different types of events, like lectures, social, and interactive. Yes. And you also talked about how difficult it is to get newcomers to feel comfortable. Yes. So of those three types of events, which ones do you think are the most appealing? I mean, the interactive is probably the best for getting them better, but when they don't even have an environment, how can you bootstrap them? Okay, so the question is, of the three types of events, <coughs> event styles, which one would be um, most attractive to newcomers? And I would say um, all of them. Uh, <coughs> first of all, lecture. People, especially who are new, like the thought of coming and listening to someone who knows what they're talking about, giving them information, getting them started. Social is very important too because then they feel more comfortable after they've kind of broken the ice and spoken with people. Okay, now I feel more comfortable kind of letting my guard down and getting involved. And of course, interactive, as you mentioned, is the best for honing their skills. And there's actually no reason why you can't combine all three into one event. But you know, how we, when you structure the event, what you decide what you're gonna do, like are you gonna have someone in front, or are you gonna have everyone at tables together in pairs, you know, or you have mingling next to some food and beverages, that, you, that's where you decide which type you're going to do for this part of the meeting. That helps. Yeah, any other questions? <coughs> yes? I'm sorry, Angela. Did you mention coding coffee? I did not. I did not mention coding coffee. Coding coffee is a cool event. Uh, we have one that meets everyone, and it's an informal thing. 
Um, usually in the same place, same time, and uh, there's not a lot of structure, but it's great for people collaborating, talking about um, what they're working on, maybe asking questions. Um, so I, yeah, I didn't really talk about code and copy at all. Um, it's very easy. Yes, it's a great way of meet, meeting other people. So certainly, that that falls into that social thing. I think it's very great for you to have some really low frequent <laughs> events like that that just happen on an ongoing basis for people to come out to. So code and copy is a wonderful thing. That's usually in new um, in new communities where I see people kind of starting out. The code and copy is usually the first thing they do, or maybe a hack fest where some business says, "Okay, you know, this night there's a hack fest." And just understand that you're not going to get a ton of people to come out to it, but but there will be some people to come out there. Make sure you always have someone at least being there. It really sucks if you say there's a code and copy and no one from the group is there and people show up and say, well, this is sucks, man, no one's here. So uh, you make sure someone's always there. But I think, it, I agree, it's, it's definitely it's great. It's Well, unless you're a morning person triathlete and then it's not hard at all. Do you have your 7 a.m.? No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I agree, 7 a.m. is a bad idea. Because only the nutty people in the morning get up and exercise and train and all that. Um, I don't know who would do that. But if there's someone like that, then um, they might do it. But the other people are like, man, you're nuts. I'm not coming to that. All right. We were done. Thank you.